that represents 20% of the economy. Media bias and stereotyping is fanning the fire of hatred and division. Dying local news outlets are crippling civic engagement. And worst of all, not seeing positive stories about their community is stifling the dreams and aspirations of black and brown children across this nation. We hosted the inaugural Multicultural Media Correspondence Dinner to ignite a call to action to move the needle on media diversity. During the dinner, we honored multicultural media luminaries who all shared their struggles and highlighted the need for increased media diversity. Association, and it quickly became a powerful platform. MMCA serves as a trusted bridge and convener, enabling difficult, solutions-focused conversations in a common ground environment. It serves as a vehicle to provide thought leadership. It effectively influences and communicates policy developments. And it provides information and resources for both individuals and stakeholder organizations. journalists and media professionals join our community and become diversity champions. And the media companies and stakeholder groups become strategic partners by providing funding and support. Together, we can move the needle on media diversity. Thank you. Good morning again. Thank you all for coming out. Uh, my name is David Morgan, and I'm the co-founder and president of the Multicultural Media Correspondents Association. We're a non-partisan nonprofit leading a national call to action to move the needle on media diversity. Uh, let me first start off by thanking all the amazing people that helped to make this uh, panel happen. And it takes a lot of work, and they did a great job of making me look good. Um, a lot of them, if, if folks have the program book, um, I just want to highlight them. First, I want to thank our, my co-executive producer, uh, Mr. Terrell D. Whitley, and his team at Liquid Soul. I also want to thank uh, our producer, uh, Wendy Anderson, who has just done an amazing job of pulling this together, and our assistant producer, Natalie Leary. Next, I also want to thank our talent and volunteer manager, Lisa Harris, and our PR lead, Martine Charles, and our digital marketing design specialist, April Johnson. I'm also excited because uh, we reached out to the Howard Communication School, and they uh, provided us with some amazing um, volunteers to help us with their production. And so, both in public relations, we have Amari Anthony and Kaylin Ware. Social media, we have Jonathan Logan and Courtney Diggs. Production, we have Ariana Cobbs, Tatiana Swain, Ashley Lauren, and helping us later at our reception is James Phillips, Michaela Mosley, Makila Daniel, and Ravon Hardwick. Um, let's all join me in thanking them. I next want to um, acknowledge our advisory board, um, some of the members here. They do an amazing job of guiding us strategically. I'm not going to go through their names, but their names are in the program. The next thing I want to do, and I really want to thank uh, our partner, the Walt Disney Company, for supporting this event, and more importantly, for what we see as the really encouraging signs of top-down and bottom-up changes that they're doing in their space to lead the way on media diversity. We're really excited and look forward to working with them in that endeavor. Uh, we also want to thank our other um, partners, uh, Nielsen and Verizon Media, uh, will be represented on the panel and also for really being willing to engage in this really important dialogue. So, I know many of you, if you look at my bio, you're probably struggling to understand why a tax lobbyist, especially the folks who know me, have gotten so involved in media diversity and wanting to lead this um, call to action. 
Well, the answer is really my conviction stems a lot from my son, Alex, who's four years old. So for me, when I look at the media landscape and the narrative, the lack of diversity is absolutely unacceptable. I'm working really hard to provide Alex with that life, and I want to make sure what he sees on the screen reflects that. And a diverse media is really important, in my mind, for that reality to happen. I want Alex to be able to dream dreams bigger than his dad and be inspired by what he sees on TV to reach that. And that's why I've become so passionate about this. This morning, I have the honor and privilege to introduce our, one of our honorary hosts for the session, who has been an amazing champion and warrior for media diversity. I'm speaking about none other than Congresswoman Dow Demings, Democrat of Florida. In just her second term, Congresswoman Demings has emerged as an extremely effective and inspiring political leader that is taking a leadership role in the effort to make media diversity a reality. From authoring a seminal resolution reaffirming Congress's commitment to diversity to launching her media diversity congressional brain trust, she is all about action, and I love it. Congresswoman Woman Deming sits on the Judiciary, Homeland Security, and Intelligence Committees, so you know she's not about wasting time. That's why I could not be more thrilled that she has taken time out of her hectic schedule to be here with us today. I encourage you to read the rest of her bio in the program, follow her on social media, and learn more about the awesome public servant from Orlando, Florida. She's joined here today by her husband, Mayor Demings, Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Congresswoman Val Demings, Chair of the Media Diversity Congressional Board. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so much. Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is such a joy for me to be back with you uh, during this 2019 annual leadership conference. As you all know, our theme this year is 400 years. Just kind of let that sit in. 400 years. Our legacy, but our opportunities. And as we reflect on today's very important subject, and we'll talk about the obstacles to media diversity, but we will also talk about the opportunities. Today, ladies and gentlemen, is all about opportunity and how we move forward. I, I just got to take just a second, take executive privilege for just a moment. Uh, David Morgan uh, mentioned uh, the Orange County mayor. Let me say this. You all know that I'm a former social worker. Uh, and I'm a former police chief. And so I was a social worker who took my police, I mean, a social worker heart into the job of being a police chief. But I always have backup with me. <laughs> and I am so proud of um, Jerry and the work that he has done in our community. You know, he served as Orlando's police chief, he served as the Orange County Sheriff, and today, he serves as the Orange County Mayor. And so I want to yet again recognize my backup, the Mayor of Orange County, Jerry Demings. <laughs> Media diversity, how we tell the story. How we tell the story, not only how we tell the story, how we tell the story is determined by who tells the story. Just think about the news that you hear, the source that delivers that news, the color or gender, the culture of the person that is delivering the news. Think about the big screen, the person who you see on the big screen. 
As we talk about opportunities, how can little black boys and black girls and others, other people of color, believe that they can if they've never seen? And so as we talk about media diversity and we look at the landscape today, 50 years ago, the Kerner Report was completed. And that report was commissioned to look at the role that media plays in some of the social discord that was occurring 50 years ago. So today we fast forward and we have to ask ourselves several questions. Is media more diverse? Is entertainment more diverse? Am I seeing people, phenomenal people, talented people who look like me in that space more today than we did 50 years ago. If we look at social discord in America, what role, because remember that's what the Kerner Report was doing, what role has media played in either, either fueling the fire or bringing calm and peace to our great nation? So today we have a Blue Star panel that will help us review the landscape and talk about the obstacles and the opportunities. I also want to thank, uh, in the 10th con Congressional District, I have the honor of um, representing Walt Disney World. And we had a meeting this morning and, uh, with some of their executives who I see here. And you know, sometimes we have a lot of people that come before us in Congress, and when we ask them to tell the story, they tell us a bunch of excuses. They give us a bunch of excuses for why we have not. Now look, we can all do a better job. We can all work harder to improve our landscape and meet our goals. But Disney was excited and passionate about telling their story in the space of media diversity and inclusion. And we have an all-star panel that you'll hear more about. I also want to talk just a minute, I'll conclude with this, that um, I'm honored to sponsor bipartisan legislation, a resolution that is co-sponsored by Jennifer Gonzalez Colon of Puerto Rico, Republican, and Senators Marco Rubio, Republican from Florida, and Jackie Rosen, Democrat from Nevada, to sponsor a resolution on media diversity where we will recommit to the goals of the vision of the Kerner Report in this space. So ladies and gentlemen, um, I hope you, if you do not know, I certainly hope that you know how I feel about you. I thank you so much in my, I'm in my second term in Congress. I thank you so much for your support, your prayers, for emailing and calling me when you're happy and when you're not so happy. <laughs> That's what being in public office is about. Thank you family, representatives from Florida and others in the room. God bless you and let's begin this very important discussion. Thank you. And now, I have the honor of introducing the next speaker, um, a master communicator. You know, I, when you start off your resume with master communicator, that's pretty good. Uh, Jeff Johnson strategist and architect of social solutions, who's as comfortable in front of the camera as he is behind the scenes, developing strategy and messages for his clients. The award-winning journalist and communication specialist is currently managing principal for the Baltimore-based strategy firm, JIJ Communications where he provides strategic insight and messaging consultant to clients in the private, public, and entertainment sections. He has conducted interviews with my president, 
President Barack Obama. <laughs> I have the microphone now, I can say what I want to say. <laughs> and several international heads of state for BET News and provides regular contact on the nationally syndicated Ricky Smiley Morning Show. Jeff formerly served as national director for the youth and college division of the NAACP and held an appointment by Russell Simmons as the vice president of the Hip Hop Summit Action Network. He is the creator, host, and executive director of Man Cave, a late night talk show targeting urban men airing on BET. Jeff is the honored husband of Jacqueline and the fortunate father of Madison, Miles, Malcolm, Baldwin, and Garvey. Please join me in welcoming <laughs> Jeff Johnson. You all were like, that's a lot of kids. Um, good, I, I believe it's still, it's afternoon. Good afternoon, it is an honor and privilege uh, to moderate the first of two panels. Um, so one, I'd like to say thank you so much to the Congresswoman um, for not only the work that she's doing around diversity in media, um, it is not easy to be a member of Congress in 2019. And so how she shows up and where she shows up, not only in her district, but all over the country, we so appreciate Congresswoman, thank you. Um, it is an interesting time in media. And so the MMCA and its leadership um, is right at the precipice of not only the work that we need to do, but the kind of conversations we need to have here at ALC. And so this first panel um, is made up of three um, executives who are doing incredible work. Um, I hope that you have Google um, because that is the only way you're going to see their entire bio uh, so that we can get right into the discussion. But I would like to introduce um, first, and I think I, I've got the right order. So Cassandra Butler, who is the Chief Marketing Officer with Braun Studios. And it's all right to give her a round of applause. Ramses John Louis, who is the global head of DNI for Verizon Media. And last but not least is Cheryl Grace, who is the SVP of US Strategic Com Community Alliances and Consumer Engagement. That is a mouthful um, for Nielsen. Let's give our panel a round of applause. So you all, let, let's get right into this. I mean, there, there is a ton of conversation. Um, many folks who are in both the private sector and in government space know that diversity and inclusion is often a buzzword that is seldom clearly defined. And so as we talk about this notion of diversity in media, I'm interested from each of you just to frame, what's the goal? Um, what does a win look like? And as we think about the work that many people in this room are doing, not only the work that, that uh, MMCA is doing, how do we know what winning is versus programs and training that take place in given organizations that don't translate into transformation or power for that matter? Sandra, so start with you. I think um, authenticity is what it looks like. And basically, the audiences that we're attempting to go for ultimately come, they, they, they come out, they, 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 they show up. Um, and I think companies, at least companies that I've been fortunate enough to work for, or work with, not for, but work with, have, um, that's been the most important thing for me. It's not just about making the product, but actually sh making sure that we're authentic. Um, you know, I can tell a quick, quick story. Fox Searchlight, um, making sure we showed a clip of God Goo Goo, where the, uh, one of the um, characters actually shows her how to comb her hair mm. because it's curly. Mm. And you start from the bottom and then basically, you know, get that through. And I, the Is president, it it, well, from the, with it with being curly, and okay. she, her not knowing because she came from certain privilege. 
Now, there was an executive there that I had to clear my clip through, and they said, this is, like, what are you talking about? Like, why, she's just combing her hair. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, no, explaining, and knowing that she heard me, and that being one of the most used clips that we actually had. So then all of a sudden we had different publicity angles. It wasn't just about a slave girl with a pretty dress on. It was about substance and the connection of two slaves kind of being in this position of like helping each other, one of privilege and one of not. So I just think those companies, or even the companies I've chosen to work with, have, they, they have to believe in who we are. Mm -hmm. And it can't just be for, mo for money. Sure. Good afternoon, CBC. I yeah, yeah. uh, just want to start off by saying very happy to be here with uh, this panel and with Jeff and, and thank Dave and Congresswoman Demings for yes. making this conversation possible, critically important. Uh, wholeheartedly agree with everything that Cassandra said. We really want to make sure that people feel comfortable bringing their authentic self into work and leveraging all of our platforms to be able to tell your story. So I usually like to start the conversation with why. Why is diversity and inclusion important? And we all know it's the right thing to do, but that's not how I start the conversation when I'm in the C-suite. Mm -hmm. I start the conversation by saying, what are our key objectives? What are our results? What do we want to drive? Do you want better decision making? Do you want better problem solving? Do you want better profitability? Do you want to lean towards innovation? We all know there's a variety of content that's available out there. Do you want to drive people to your content? How do we do that? We have to leverage diversity and inclusion for the purposes of innovation in order for us to reach our key objectives and to drive innovation within our organization. Fantastic. Yeah. And I think from Nielsen, and Nielsen, if you guys don't know, is the company that measures what consumers watch, what consumers buy, what they listen to, where they listen to it, how they watch it, where they're watching it. We measure all of that. And so from our perspective, a win is when we actually see nuanced layers of stories being told across all of these wonderful platforms that we as African Americans now have access to. So when we're measuring all of those platforms, whether it's traditional television or radio or streaming for audio or video, where are we actually seeing our stories being told and are they actually showing an uptick in that was those content oriented um, programming or are we not seeing that when we see an uptick that's when we know that we're getting it right and this year we just released our um, consumer report shameless plug um, it's it's in the bag that's what we're yes, calling it yes. it's in the bag uh, the african-american the black consumers path to purchase and we literally talk about how you go from being um, a conscious consumer and making your decisions to getting to that purchase point in, in determining what you're going to buy. And advertising and content has a lot to do with that. So let me dig a little bit deeper, because I appreciate the frame so far. But, but I'm also interested, in, at the end of the day, how are we best impacted? And if diversity and inclusion, from a media standpoint, is only about us getting content that looks like us, that's not enough for me. I want power, I want money, I want equity, I want ownership. And so if, if diversity in some way, shape, or form isn't pushing that, then how, how do we talk a little bit about the mutually beneficial process? Because I think, I think you're right, right? We're, we're, when we're talking to C-suite folks, we're not talking about the moral imperative, we're talking about core business values, we're talking about KPIs that drive business, we're talking about goals that help increase market share and market differentiation. But, but what's the litmus for us that these moves in diversity and inclusion and hopefully equity are actually working for us? What does winning look like as you see from, from that perspective? Sure, so our approach is we like to take a comprehensive uh, strategy towards diversity and inclusion. So we have five major priorities. One, we really make sure that we have a strong governance model. At the end of the day, you can't improve what you don't measure. Everything we do in the DNI space, we have to start with what Cheryl is providing. Yes. The, what does the data tell us? How do we build our strategy and have it informed by the data to really make sure that we make the right decisions? A second component is the workforce, making sure that we're reflective of the communities we serve. Mm -hmm. Programming, making sure that we have diversity in front of the camera, behind the camera, as well as in the business. Supply diversity is important. We have to be able to you know, put our money where our mouth is. Fortunately, through Verizon, we're part of the billion dollar round table. We spend over a billion dollars with minority owned firms and women owned vendors. Thank you, thank you for that. 
And also, how do we contribute to corporate social responsibility? You know, how do we give back to the communities where we have the pleasure of being able to, to work and to live in? So all of that goes towards the strategy of what we need to do in order to move the needle. But in terms of what she said, it makes a good point. What does winning look like? You know, you could have a room full of folks that's looking diverse. Are you being successful? Are you winning? No, not necessarily. Because you want people to do more than just check out their personality as they're walking into the lobby to go to their desk. If you do that, if people don't feel comfortable speaking up, you'll have some missteps that happen. You know, you're like, did they not have an African American person in the room when they came up with this model? Did they not have a Latinx person? So again, it's more than just having a bunch of people that look different. Those folks have to be empowered yes. to be able to come up with solutions. That's the only way we're able to move the needles. And you're right, the other thing is we could have a room full of people that look different. Are they in the right roles? We need people in the marketing department, yes. in the finance department, in the business development and the strategy, and we also need people in senior level roles. Mm -hmm. And all of those are opportunities that we have to take a look at and measure and make sure that we put a strategy together. Sure, sure. Yeah. No, no, go, go ahead. Yeah. So, so like one of the things that you mentioned was the whole training thing. And that's one of the things that always perked my ears up. Something happens you're like, oh, you know what we need to do? Let's roll out unconscious bias training. That's, that's the silver bullet. It's not a silver bullet. Right. Unconscious bias training is a foundation that you need so we speak the same language. But what your focus needs to be on is conscious inclusion. Yes. What are you specifically going to do to move the needle to really make sure we have position and power that can green light the projects? Green light the projects and make sure that the projects are seen. So we need people in all of these roles. We need folks on research. We need folks in the studio. We need people in Congress. We need people facilitating yes. these discussions. Mm -hmm. But they're not going to green light anything yeah. unless they know that there is some revenue Stats. waiting for them at the yeah. end. Yeah. And that revenue comes from the insights and data that they choose every single day to decide um, which shows are hot, which shows are doing well, which shows aren't. And if we don't have people who are like producing yeah. and, and providing or on air talent, if we don't have those individuals that our consumers, you all, are actually looking at. So when you put eyeballs to the screen, and that screen could be on your phone, it could be yes. the big traditional television screen, wherever you're watching it, if you're not actually showing up in large numbers, they're never going to get to the discussion at your boardroom table because they're going to say, well, you know, we don't really see that the audience is there. They can no longer deny that we're there. We're there. They can no longer deny that the shows that are actually very, very diverse are, are showing outpacing yes. all of the other programming choices that are there. Because y'all watch a lot of TV. But, Not you, but your cousins. Yeah, yeah. And they watch like 15 hours or more of television every single week. And that's traditional television. Traditional television is still the number one place where you're going to find African American viewers, followed by the streaming choices. But traditional TV and what's really popping right now are those cable network um, opportunities simply because they have given us the diverse programming. Yeah. And so that's where we're going. And we've got some numbers we can share later on, but that's where the eyeballs are going to right now. Well, and, and, let, and let's do that, right? Because the, the, the dangerous thing for us to do is to talk about the first or the last thing we need to do versus understanding there's a chessboard. Yes. And we need to be doing these things at the same time. And so yes. as much as consumers need to be educated in how executives are making decisions and playing a role in helping them make those decisions, we also need to play this game of delineating the multiple places where diversity can take place. Yeah. And, and we talk a lot about diverse content. I, I don't think that there's a, a, a lack of narrative around needing to have more diverse content that tells our stories in a more complex way, that ensures we're not viewed as monoliths. That's been consistent. It doesn't mean that we've gotten there, but that narrative is consistent. I don't always hear the same level of conversation in really talking about what's the executive play. And how are we moving either through our organizations or through the advertisers that impact some of these companies to talk about who's, who is on your governance board? Who are your senior executives? Does that governance board and those senior executives reflect not only the content you're creating, but the consumer base that you have? And so how do, how do we push that conversation? Not to be above or below, but so that we are at the same time making sure that that's not lost in the conversation about content. Push it to who, yeah. corporate or consumer? That's the question I'm asking. Yeah. <clears throat> well, for, I mean, I'll say this from an entertainment standpoint, the unfairness and where we have to speak up as executives is, I know several studios, I've worked for studios 
where it's one or two of us yep. to handle everything. So all of a sudden, it's like, my job is a publicist, but now I'm in advertising. Now I'm reading scripts. Now I'm doing, but I, don't, I can't be the voice for all. So that means that. Why not? You, you get tired. Right, right, right. right. That's why they hire the black person. Right, right. But the bottom line is, we have to make sure that we're reaching back and making sure consultants are coming on. Yes. Our executives are making sure that we're reaching back and making sure consultants are coming on. Yes. Our executives are coming on and bringing them in and making sure that they understand that I'm not here just for, I mean, I did Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. I've just worked on Bombshell, which is probably the whitest movie you're ever going to see this year, with um, Charlie Theron and um, um, Nicole Kidman and Margot Robbie. We do it all. We have to do it all. So it's a real disadvantage for them not to have us in the room. Because the world, we need to look more like the world does. Right. So I don't, you know, the companies that are losing Gucci, H&M, like, you know, they've called friends of mine and said, hey, Ruth Carter, I'll just say her name, Black Panther. You know, I, they wanted her to consult for H&M, but we had a long conversation. What does consult mean? Does that mean that you're bringing, being brought into the process of every line of everything that they're doing? And then have they penetrated and said to the culture of H&M, this is what we're doing, and this is why she's important, and this is her team. But, but you have to also, yeah. so going back to yes, your yes. Um, comment where you have to be like the jack of all trades or the jackie of all trades mm -hmm. in your case. So calling costume designers yes. about d &I may not be the best yes, strategic yes, yes, way, yes, yes. right? And so I saw that with how some of the brands handled when they got called on the carpet. They went to the fashion experts. Yes. The fashion experts aren't necessarily the DNI experts. Yeah, so yeah, they should yeah, have been yeah, tapping yeah, into yeah. that community and and using our strategy yeah. and our our perspective as opposed to just saying, well we know you're an influencer. Yeah. So let's go let's take the easy low hanging fruit. And I think that's where brands get a little bit and that's why. But, 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 it's all, but it's also intentional. Yeah, it's so, oh, absolutely. So, so, so much of the work that, that I do with companies around d and I, I know the difference between those that are trying to navigate to the other side of crisis Correct. versus those that are trying to create institutional Band shifts. Yeah. 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 And you, you identify influencers when you want to get on the other side of crisis. Exactly. Yeah. You identify d &I practitioners when you mm -hmm. want to create institutional shifts. Absolutely. And, and yeah. as a D&I yeah. practitioner, I'd be the first to say, uh, diversity and inclusion, if it lives in the HR department or among a DNI team, yeah. it will not be successful. Well, yeah. So who do you go and speak to? We have to hold our chief executive officers yeah. and our leadership yeah. team responsible. They're responsible for really making sure that they have a succession plan in place that's reflective of the communities that, that yeah. we, we, we would like to serve. And, so, and so, I have to, real quick, yeah, yeah, Cheryl, because yeah. what I don't want to be is that panel where there's three minutes left and then we open the mic. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to open the mic after this next question okay. for okay. you all to begin to engage. That's all I have in the whole panel? No, sir. No, sir. Oh, OK. Oh, thank you. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that, right. that yeah. five minutes came up quick. <laughs> <laughs> so so as, as we shift to, to, to open the floor, um, as, as you all think, I'd love at least one of you mm -hmm. to give me an example of something recent where you have seen a shift in how either a studio or a, or a media provider or a distributor has, has done business as it relates to DNI and a short-term impact that was, that was one to show the business case for the fact that this needs to keep going, not only for them, but for, for their peers. I'll just say Disney has done Disney, it very right. well. I mean, Black Panther has changed the game in multiple thought facets. You cannot, you need to be authentic. It showed that you need to be authentic. And they care. I mean, I've come to plenty of events where literally, and I'm not a Disney employee, but literally where Disney yeah. says, hey, you know what? We're going to introduce you to our ESPN, or we're going to introduce you to ABC, and to Fox, and to all of their brands, but also making sure they're speaking to their corporations and also their sure. executives. And I would also add Procter & Gamble yeah, to yeah, the list. Yeah, uh, they okay. recently came out with this thing called The Look, the look, the look. which actually, you know, if you haven't seen it, you know, yeah. Google it and take a look at it. Yeah, and it's, okay. it's really great. It follows this African-American character and it, it has a conversation about 
you know, all of the looks that oh, happen yes. on an unconscious level that you receive on a daily basis and the messages that it sends. As so, a black man. As, as yes. an American yeah. And they so. submitted that to Can, right. yeah. and it won the Golden it Bear. Did. For well, and, and beyond that, because I think, it's, I, I think yeah. it's important yeah. to mention, not only did they do that, but they acquired, um, but they acquired Bevel. Right. And in acquiring Bevel, you paid a brother a whole lot of money right. mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. left him in charge of the brand. Yes. Yeah. So as opposed to taking the brand, doing cultural appropriation, mm -hmm. yes. and saying now we, now we know what black people think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and there's some, I, I, there's some great <laughs> brothers and sisters at, at P&G on the executive mm -hmm. side, so that's not to say that there's not, but when you have a level of cultural integrity to the person that created the brand, continue to leave them in yeah. control even as you've paid them, I think those are also some of the subtle nuances that show that this kind of diversity push is not just about the product themselves and gaining market share, yeah. but maintaining the leadership that developed that product in the first place. So I want, I want to open the floor because I know they're going to tell us we don't have yeah, a lot yeah, of time yeah. and get as many questions as possible. So as you come to the mic to engage these executives, there's three rules. One is ask a question. Number uh, The second rule is ask a question. The third rule is ask a question. Uh, if you don't ask a question within 20 seconds, I will ask you what is your question. Okay, let's start. Yes, next. Nice. With regard to ownership, one of the best tools we had was the tax certificate program, which went away many moons ago. Um, I've been responsible for drafting a report to Congress to talk about market entry barriers, and we always, and any legislative proposals, one of the things we always so say is the tax certificate program. So I want to know what is the pathway to, to, for Congress to look at reinstituting the tax certificate program, of course, maybe in a modified way or taking account of the current state of affairs. But that was the best tool for ownership. Perfect. Thank you. Congresswoman, do you want to address yeah, that? Because yeah, none of yeah, us are yeah, in Congress. Yeah. 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 I'm like, say what? Right. <laughs> <Thank> you, <Jeff. laughs> of the um, couple of things, the brain trust that we've started and the work that will uh, be spearheaded from the resolution that was passed is coming up with solutions, real solution-based programs. And how can we provide incentives for what you're talking about? The, path, the tax base certificate is one of those incentives. We talked specifically about the film industry and, and my home state of Florida and great for California and great for Georgia, but when you think about film and when you think about Florida of yesterday, movies were made in Florida of yesterday, so what incentives can we provide that will bring the industry back? And so in, we're gonna have an advisory board of experts as a part of the Brain Trust that will come up with solutions that you've talked about. And, and, and it's been it's been fantastic for cities like where I'm from, like Cleveland, mm -hmm. which is taking advantage of the tax credit. And, and the last few Fast and Furious, Marvel films yes. have all had pieces done in Cleveland. And you've seen people of color that have gained access to the supply chain of those productions. I think I think to date, 12,000 full time jobs um, and a multitude of other business and dollars that have come into the city of Cleveland just as a result of taking advantage of that tax credit. So thank you so much for that question, and thank you so much, yeah, Congressman. Yeah, yeah. Thank, yes, thank sir. you for answering. Hi, everyone. Um, I have a question. Do you or have you noticed a change in original programming and content being, um, I guess, targeted towards African-American communities? To provide some context, um, in the early 90s, and the content I consumed, I feel like there was a renaissance of original programming. Your Moishas, your Fresh Princess of Bel Airs. Um, and now I noticed that I think reality TV has sort of taken over the landscape. And I'm wondering, do you have any comments or insight to that sort of shift in programming? So I can actually tell you, reality yeah. TV has hands down taken over yeah. cable and network, right? Which is um, why when you look at, I'm assuming you're, you're like 18 to 34, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So when we take a look at, <laughs> and proud of it, um, when you take a look at what 18 to 34 year olds are watching, most of that content is reality TV. The number one network that you guys are watching is VH1. What's leading that pack is Love and hip hop. I mean, it's love and hip hop nine, love and hip hop uh, five, love and hip hop Atlanta, love and hip hop Miami, love and hip hop eight. Like it goes on and on and on. So 
I'm always interested when I hear um, people from your age group saying, like, when do we get something more than reality TV? Y'all gotta stop watching reality TV. Right. That's what happens. But we also, but we all, but we also, and, 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 I, and I love for you to talk about this because I think the question is important. There's so many content providers. Yes. Yeah. And many of them, whether it's kind of, we talked about this earlier, whether it's a kind of cultural decision that a Bronze Studios or even an HBO is taking, there is a renaissance of scripted content. Absolutely. And, and so as that renaissance of scripted content is taking place, what are some of the things that folks out here should be thinking about so that the Issa Rays of the world are not the anomalies as they're able to navigate into a space like HBO, show market value, and create multiple platforms as a result of that value? You know, yeah. what, are, what are some of the insights we see there, and what are some of the things that both as consumers and content creators we should be thinking about? Any so of you? so I, yeah, I, yeah, I definitely yeah. think, you know, having the conversation around DNI, looking at uh, ethnicity, yeah. looking at gender is important, but I think we just touched on something right now in this conversation nice. that looking at the intersectionality with regards to uh, generations. Mm -hmm. You know, what's uh, millennials consuming? Yeah. What's Gen Z consuming? Uh, making sure that we're inclusive of LGBTQ mm -hmm. and people with disabilities. So again, there's a, a variety of different content that's out there. How do you leverage those different platforms that best fit? the story that needs to be told. Yeah. And there's emerging platforms that's coming out as well when you have AR and when you have VR as well. Yeah. So how do you leverage that for that specific demographic that you're looking for? Because everyone wants to tap into the millennial and the Gen Z market. So they are really going to gravitate towards, let's give them what they want, yeah, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean? Until you get someone that's an innovator that's like, let me challenge them, yeah. you know, kind of the way Apple did. Like, let me tell you what you're gonna want exactly. and you're gonna fall in love with them. And, and, and nuanced and culturally layered programming is key yes. and that shows up whether you're 18 to 34 or 35 plus if you are having a story that is being presented to you that is nuanced and layered and reflects your culture these numbers are actually showing hands down we've seen an uptick in the viewing habits of blacks for those shows versus um, regular network shows the queen yeah, sugars yeah, of the yeah, world the and queen right. sugars yeah. own the no, ruling yes, it yes. and uh, adults 35 plus but that's because they've got those nuanced programs that are out there. I think if you're not ever trying to be everything to everybody, right? You can't be everything to everybody. You got to be something to somebody. So if you can figure that out, and that's really like super, super important. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Want to make sure we get these two questions. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Thank you. So, Miss Grace, you talked about um, black viewers dominating television consumption, but we also know that at the intersection of TV consumption is like social TV, people engaging on their second screen at the same time. But that's, that's really has, fu has fueled um, the entertainment business a lot lately in television and film, but especially television. But have you, do you know of any efforts to make sure that there is more black inclusion at the social networks and particularly Twitter since social television is such a huge part of what's going on with television consumption now? Yeah, so um, YouTube is the number one choice that we're choosing to watch video, uh, followed by Netflix. Um, and then when you take a look at the social media platforms that we're going to, Facebook is still 67% of us are going and watching or, or engaging with Facebook, followed by, um, I don't want to say it wrong, so it's Facebook, but it's also followed by uh, is IG, Twitter? IG, Instagram. Instagram. No, it's Instagram. It's Instagram. It's Instagram because again, it goes back to the youthfulness of our population. Fifty-four percent of our population is under the age of thirty-five, so that's going to actually have an influence on what we're um, syncing up with, or watching, or engaging with on social media. So uh, Instagram, and then it is Pinterest, yeah. and then Twitter. So you actually kind of see where those fall out. But I, I want to build on something she asked, because if, if, if you yes, don't think yes. the diversity and inclusion space is necessary as you're talking about um, social media managers, um, yeah. if you don't think there's a bunch of black folks behind social media, then you did not pay attention to Popeyes, to right. Chick-fil-A, right. 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 to Burger right. King. Yes, yes. Those were black folks <laughs> right. that were driving that discussion that took place. I can't and I'm not, and I'm not talking, I'm not yeah, talking yeah. about black Twitter. I'm talking about black influencers yeah. and corporations that understand how to connect through social media in a way that others have not mastered social media. And so again, how do we need to start leveraging some of the things that we innately do? 
to be able to turn them into position and opportunity within these corporations without it just being one-off project-based, but really the beginning of, of training a whole new set of, of practitioners and executives? Sure, I think, I think that's a great question. Uh, so again, uh, Verizon Media, we're Yahoo, we're AOL, we're Huffington Post, we're in the business of connectivity. We connect people to people, connect people to information, entertainment, and news the way they like to consume it. So when you take a look at that, we actually hire tons of social media scientists on a regular basis to see how we can drive people to our ecosystem. How do we take it from, all right, we notice a couple of influence, influencers with a couple of hundred thousand folks, as opposed to just promote this one idea, how do you bring them into the office and have a conversation in terms of, I don't want to just do one thing for you. How do we develop your multicultural content strategy? How do we develop your Latinx strategy? How do we develop your African-American strategy? And how do we build together as opposed to a one and done and, and keep it moving? But let me ask you this, because what happens all the time is you bring them in, you have a round table of influencers that are Latinx, that are black, that are LGBTQ, that are, that are all of these folks that know the culture you give them lunch, and you get them to give you free stuff, free information. Mm. Then you got folks that don't know nothing, that put together a strategy based on the intel you got from them, and none of them get a contract, none of them get a job, none of them get a position. I'm not saying Verizon. Thank you. I am. <laughs> but I'm saying we understand that this is often how the business is done. And so, so you know, oftentimes we have folks like, like MMCA that are fighting for the development of pipeline so that when folks are looking for positions, they do that, but they can't be the only ones. Yeah. And so do you see folks that are doing that, especially in the digital space? Is that an opportunity for somebody that's out here to begin to develop yeah. uh, talent pools that can yeah. serve as pipelines for corporate rates? Really would love to hear your thoughts before we get this last question. Sure, that's another great yeah. question. I think just in general, in entertainment media communications, you have to make sure that those type of things do not happen. And the way you do it, I'm an attorney by trade, so when I have a conversation with someone, I always tell them, you know, you need to know who your board of advisors. You need to have a good attorney on deck. You need to have a good accountant on deck. You need to be able to know what are you gonna present and how far you're gonna take how the conversation. Take Don't get excited about the free lunch. Right, <laughs> you know, you right, go there, you right. build a relationship, and you talk about what's the follow-up gonna look like. But there is gonna be a certain level of trust that has to take place, but you have to make sure you have the right team that can help guide you through that. And you made a point yeah. earlier about making sure that whoever you have making those decisions in those conference rooms, that they are comfortable with having these conversations mm -hmm. and that they understand that we expect that there are going to be dollars. Don't nickel and dime yeah, yeah, my yeah, vendors yeah, 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 yeah. and say, well, we can give you a $350,000 yeah, yeah, contract, yeah, yeah. but we're giving a $350 million contract to someone else, right. not Nielsen. Yeah, but yeah. you know you can't you can't have those conversations with individuals at the table who want to treat you like you're a large entity but don't pay you That's on time. Right. Large entities yeah, can yeah. like go yeah, and, yeah, a little yeah, longer yeah, yeah, yeah. than the normal small black business. And so if we have those opportunities, but we don't have people in the decision making seats who can say, yeah. hey. You can't pay a small vendor the way you can pay a large conglomerate. They're two different structures. So bring them in, pay them differently, and make them feel valued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. And for those of you that don't know, um, brilliant sister, uh, Cheryl Hardy, um, who's at Google, um, has been part of putting together a group called NextGen. And so for a lot of content creators, they brought them together, and Google has kind of led the way in having conversations around IP and protecting IP about how you enter into these spaces, yes. about how you have the conversation, even about the policy implications around everything from net neutrality to other issues of IP. So if you're not familiar with NextGen, please check it out, because I think it, it also yeah, yeah. You know, speaks yeah. to this, not just diversity inclusion piece, but owning your stuff yeah. and being able to maximize what you get from the, the brilliance that you all, um, especially those content yeah, creators yeah. have. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I believe Mr. Johnson pretty much touched on this question a little bit, but I wanted to delve into it a little bit more. How do you reconcile uh, the need for complex and multidimensional stories and knowing the possibility that it might not be all that profitable? Hmm. So, you know, you were talking about the Queen Sugars and even Pose. Like, those are kind of the exceptions to the rule. And they had big names involved to push those along with respective networks, but for other stories like that that don't 
might not have the name, but the need is there. How do you kind of convince? Okay, okay. okay. So, so I just want to make sure yeah. with the question, are we talking about how do we convince networks that these are profitable, or how do we talk to content creators about their decision making in being multi-layered yeah. or being singularly focused? The former, mainly okay. because we have content creators. No, I just, I just, want, to, I just want to make yeah. sure the question we were well, I, I, I mean, coming out of Bronze Studios, um, I've only I've been there a little less than a year. Um, we package everything that we do, and we are pretty much, we finance films, and we are now in the creative space. So we're a um, company with five companies underneath them. So you kind of identify the right company you're going to. But I will say, it's been very, very important in my, what I've learned in a short period of time, packaging with someone that makes sense to a, for your content to air is super important. Yeah. And that's what, and, 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 and I've not seen it kind of happen any other way. It's a rare occasion that you get like a, on a film side, a beast of the Southern Wild, or even a 12 Years a Slave. Those are very, very rare occasions. It's up, a, truly an up, uphill battle regardless of the circumstance. But there's projects that I'm, we're doing with social justice, so who do you couple that with? That might be, hey, Mahershala Ali, or Jada Pinkett Smith. It's super, super important because you're still, once you get there, I think Red Table Talk, Facebook is probably very, very happy with what they're doing. But until you get there, I don't know if that show would have worked without Jada. The mom and the daughter could have still had the conversation, but I don't know if that would have made sense. And Will Smith probably saying, I will come in occasionally. But I definitely see um, everything that we put money into, there is some form of prestige or package our talent attachment. Sure, sure. It just makes I, want, it easier. I want you to answer that, but then yes, I want to make yes, sure that yes. this, we get this last uh, yeah, question yeah, yeah, before yeah, we yeah, yeah, introduce the so next panel. You're watching, you're watching video content constantly yeah. now. I watch it when I'm standing in line at the grocery store. I watch it when I'm on planes. I'm watching it from all of these multiple devices. In order for me to watch, I have to have content in which to watch. Yeah. And so most of what I'm watching has a name brand to it, but a lot does it. So those streaming sources are opportunities. And if you um, are, are feeling like you need to find a different way to reach the streaming sources mm -hmm. themselves, Issa Rae, anyone? Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah, so she yeah. started with her YouTube channel yes. and it turned yeah. into something that HBO picked up. So there are opportunities for you to use and get your voice out there. It may take you a little bit a little longer, longer. Yeah. than the, tradi the traditional route, but it's still a way, a platform for you to engage in. And that also helps you tell your story your way. Your way. Because once they get the rights yes. to your story, it disappears. It ain't your story yeah, no yes. more. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, as yes. podcasting continues to grow, yes. uh, what would you all say um, <laughs> is the state of black podcasting and where it's going? Great question. Podcasting is hot yeah. right now. Yeah. It is so hot and black consumers are driving podcasts because again, it's a way for us to hear our stories in a way that isn't monitored or measured by the FCC or any of the other government, um, governmental agencies. And so our voices are being heard. Start a podcast, yeah. Spotify was really looking yeah. at um, having more exposure to black listeners because they reckon, they see that you all are listening and they are paying attention to it. So pay attention to the brands that are paying attention to you. Pay attention to the brands that are advertising to you. Pay attention to the brands that show up and sponsor these types of yes. activities, yes. right? You have to make sure that we're actually giving back to the brands that are giving to us. To us. Sure, but, but, but dig down on that for me a little bit because, because podcasting is not new. But the business of podcasting, business of they're it. still figuring it out. Yes, they are. And so what are some of the things that we need to be thinking about, whether it's from a legislative perspective or even a marketing and packaging perspective, to be able to maximize on the soon-to-come profitability that, had, that doesn't yet match the access? You can make a podcast and distribute it. But, but the dollars and the advertising, they're still figuring out the monetization process. They are. So, so what are some of the things we should be thinking about? A collective, as I'll just say a collective, getting together with a collection of people where you know similar stories are like-minded content creators so that you can build your numbers and then come in with that. 
And then that's that, that's. But, but that's with the collective, is there is there also a business opportunity? Again, yes. so often we're late to the party, yeah. and so we're competing with other people's distribution networks. No, we're not going to compete with Spotify or, or Apple. But but what are some of the business opportunities? That because before we, we, we get out of here, the, the yeah. last question I had for you, and, and you can answer it in conjunction with this or not, as we think about this delineation between diversity and inclusion and or outright ownership. Yes. What should we be thinking about in the media space as some of the greatest opportunities for out and out ownership so we're not asking somebody else to give us an opportunity? We're setting the, the, the standard in the marketplace. I'm going to tell you the number one opportunity is gaming, video gaming. Yeah. Yeah. Seventy three percent of blacks say that they consider themselves gamers um, and that's 73 percent of y'all. And it is a thirty three billion dollar industry yeah. compared compared to the movie industry, which is about eleven billion. Right. Thirty three billion. But we're not seeing ourselves in these games. So if you are a gamer, if you are a programmer, if yes. you are a content developer, if you can um, uh, develop games that tell our stories and package it up and market it to any of these angel investors who can get you yeah. up and running, there is liquid gold in gaming. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And I would add to that, I think the packaging up is a critical component. It's very, very important for you to do your research, mm -hmm. for you to know who your audience is yes. with whatever content you're creating. Yes. And you do the research before going to a going studio to, yeah. or going yeah. to a digital platform and find out what brands will resonate with that. And the more you do up front, the more control yes. over your project. Yes. Are you going to go and look for someone that's going to give you funding to create your content? Or are you going to go to someone who's a content aggregator? If you decide to actually go to a brand and get the funding yourself, then you have more of an ability to go yeah. to an aggregator and you have more of a way to say, I want to control a little bit more of the project uh, and I want to have more of the long-term benefit as opposed to a, a big cash payout up front. Which is what Issa did yep. very well. And, and Ava DuVernay. Yep. But advertising drives everything. Yes. And advertising is declining for black focused media. I can't say African American media anymore because we don't have but a handful of companies that are owned by us. So, but um, content that is focused for African Americans, we've seen a decrease in advertising across the board. But, but can you, can you, because I, I don't want to let you out of here before we talk about this, because if, if we're talking about the global implications and we're talking about the value proposition and diversity and inclusion, African American is not the play. Right. The, the play is the diaspora. Yes. And so, where are you seeing us taking advantage of a Nigerian marketplace, a Kenyan marketplace, a Brazilian marketplace? And again, whether we're driving um, expansion of content from a company like Verizon, or whether we're challenging small content creators to not just. Some of you watched Man Cave. Uh, on BET, and BT canceled us, and that's all right. Um, <laughs> that's what happened. Is it really? No, no, it is. No, it is because they gave me the ability to do proof of concept, and right. now I'm talking to some other folks that like us more. Right. So, but 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 part of the conversation is we don't want to just do man cave US. Right. As soon as we launch, we want to do. We got four brothers in the UK to do US and UK launch at the same time with, with, an, with the desire to go diasporic. But, but we're not so often talking about that when we're talking about diversity and inclusion unless you're an existing multinational corporation. So how should we be thinking differently, not only as content creators, but as people pushing diversity and inclusion as a, as a business practice, including the broader global market versus just the domestic one. And, 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 and then we'll, we'll transition oh to I, I think we got to start hiring some of our brothers across the continent. Yeah, because I mean, sisters and different. brothers, because at the end of the day, I mean, I go into meetings and it's always, no matter what the story is, they'll say these stories aren't traveling. And, and I and think it's about relying, always, it's yeah, about yeah. relying on the, uh, the data as well. Yeah, I mean, Cassandra yeah, yeah. started off talking about the success of Black Panther. So you, you yes. have those projects that yeah. do fantastic yeah. globally. Yeah. You got to go in armed yes. as a part of your yes. arsenal to be able to like talk about those. And then look at some organizations that's really doing the global thing global well, thing. who's yeah. really bringing in diverse stories. So Disney does a good job of that when you take a look at the last 
uh, yeah. series of animated films that they've come out with. Netflix really makes sure that they really tap into local markets. And again, it's all about you know more than just the diversity in front of the camera, but you know get the local this, crew, yeah. get the local yeah. staff. Yeah. Yeah. All of that is important. Everything's not coming out of LA. That's not yeah, the case yeah. anymore. That was that probably like 50 years ago, but it's it's everywhere, and you really have to tap into the talent in, at those local markets. Yeah. So let, let's. But you have to also recognize that diversity and inclusion doesn't mean the same thing here in the United States that it and does yes, in I Africa, that, that it yes, does yes. in the UK. They have totally different right. issues and areas of concern. And so you're right. You have to have people from those cultures yeah. who can help you tap into those cultures. Because if you take a historically black African American rather story and try to just get it recreated over someplace else, it's not going to have the same level of success. So that's something to just kind of keep in mind together, as well. I mean, yeah. work, we, working mm -hmm. together is super, super so important. So let's give an amazing round of applause to this panel, to Cheryl. And we, I know we have a fantastic panel following this one. So again, thank you all so thank much. You. Thank you. Get your report at nielsen.com slash African Americans. It's got everything you need in it. Shameless plug. <laughs> Our astounding planet. introduce and ask our moderator for the next panel our next our moderator for the next panel is none other than Terrell D Whitley who is the CEO of Liquid Soul and also a member of the Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Science join me in welcoming Terrell D Whitley to the mic Thanks, David. Thanks, David. So we're going to turn things around uh, really quickly. But while we're doing that, uh, let me give you guys some great reminders. Number one, we want to be active on social media. So please follow us, number one, at, at MMCADC. Again, on all platforms, that's Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at MMCADC. And then if you could hashtag. M-M-C-A-C-B-C, that would be magnificent, as well as we're using the hashtag M-M-C-A-2019. Um, and really, uh, and then they gave me a third hashtag. Man, this is a lot of hashtags, okay. The, the last hashtag is hashtag media diversity means. So listen, be active on social media. We have some phenomenal speakers uh, that are coming forward. I'd like to take a second and, of course, acknowledge our gracious host, uh, Representative Val Demings from the great state of Florida, once again. Thank you, Representative Val Demings. And then her rock star husband, Mr. Mayor Jerry Demings here. Thank you, sir. And if you're on your phone now, you might want to go ahead and send a text, send a tweet, because in a little while, we have Mr. Joe Morton coming up. Thank you, Mr. Morton. So Papa Pope is in the house. Get ready. I'm a little scared. I'm a little nervous. Papa Pope does that to you. It's all right. So I know we're going to have an exciting time. So um, a couple things. Let me ask some questions. How many people in, in the room are in entertainment or media? Perfect. Perfect. How many people have been on a set? OK. OK. Do we have directors in the room? I see a few hands. Producers? I see a lot of hands. OK. Writers? Fantastic. Executives? Ah, I love those hands. So we're going to have our next panel is going to be an extremely active conversation around uh, really all of those topics and really how we pull them together. Uh, the most wonderful part of it is that we have all black women. Can I get a hand for that? And so we're going to have a little black women magic as we uh, dive into that conversation. I, uh, I've been working to be qualified. I've been married for 22 years to a black woman. Uh, I've been with her 28 years. I got two girls at home, 17 and 15. Uh, we used to have a dog. Dog was female, too. Uh, so 
I think I've lived enough time in the space with some women that I can speak a little intelligently about it, but I don't, trust me, I've been married long enough to know I do not know everything yet. Uh, I was telling uh, Mr. Morton that I was recently ill on Monday, and uh, you know, my wife also left that same day for a women's retreat with the church. And so I called her, I said, hey baby, I got a little ill, I think I ate something that wasn't too great. I said, if I know the girls got this coming up, she said, oh, that's, that's unfortunate, but here's what I want to tell you. She said, listen, uh, man up. <laughs> And, um, and trust that it will all be okay. And I thought, I said, was, is that the advice? Is that all I get? And she said, yeah, 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 I, I, I'll call you back. Me and the ladies, we, we're headed to go shopping. And I said, okay, all right. Uh, so I think she still loves me. I still do my part, but I, uh, I also will continue to man up, I guess. But I'm here. Did I man up? I'll take it, okay, all right. Um, I think we're just about ready. So I want to start by introducing uh, our panel and uh, what, again, we have some magnificent, magnificent speakers. So I'd love to give their introductions and uh, their bios as they come to the stage. So let me start with uh, the esteemed Vanessa Morrison. Now, I met Vanessa several, several years ago. I called her. I actually did a cold call to Vanessa's office. I was working for Fox. And I asked a question to some of my colleagues. I said, hey, who's the highest ranking executive over here of Af this African American? And they said, Vanessa Morrison. And I was like, I need to meet this woman. And then they said, she's in animation. I said, what? An African American woman was leading animation? I had never heard of it. And I was so, so gone. Um, so let me give you some of her background so you understand how deep this woman is and how important she is to our industry. Vanessa Morrison was, was named president of Fox Family, the entire division, in October of 2017 after serving as president of 20th Century Fox Animation since 2007. What year is it now? Since 2007, president. She previously uh, operated as executive vice president at 20th Century Fox Live Action, senior vice president of production and vice president of production for the studio. She's been a whole lot of vice president, senior vice president, executive, and president twice. How about that? Uh, at Fox Family, she oversees several projects, uh, The Girl Who Drank the Moon, uh, as well as, uh, let's see here, uh, I'm sorry, several, ch Cheaper by the Dozens, uh, as well as a Kenya Abaris animated content based on Ice Age characters, even Night at the Museum and Diary of, of a Wimpy Child, a Wimpy Kid. How many people have seen some of those films? <laughs> outstanding, outstanding. And those things are coming to Disney Plus. In 2019, she was named the Women in Film Board of Directors and currently serves on the UC Berkeley Chancellor's Vit Vit Board of Visitors and the Women in Animation Advisory Board. Is there any woman here that's interested in animation? Bless you. Um, you need to know this woman. You need to know this woman. She's a graduate of the University of California at Berkeley and UCLA's MFA program in film and television. Please welcome the fantastic Vanessa Morrison. All right, she gave me some good correction. That's what black women do, thank you. Uh, next up, I wanna introduce Can uh, Connie Orlando. So there was a show uh, some years ago on uh, BET, The Monique Show. Anybody remember that show? And uh, I was called to do some marketing with The Monique Show, and one of the persons they asked me to meet with was Connie Orlando. And uh, she had one of the warmest spirits. And then I came back for a second show, which was Sunday's Best. And again, it was Connie Orlando. I think there was a third show. I can't remember the title. And I walked in. There's Connie Orlando again. Connie Orlando, I see her on so many sets and so many shows. And she moves from West Coast to East Coast faster than anybody I know. If, if somebody has figured out how to like teleport, I do think it is her. I do think it's Connie. 
Connie is the executive vice president and head of programming for BET Networks, a unit of Viacom. Uh, she's been there for several years, running on several different programs, some things I'm sure that you know, being Mary Jane, uh, as, as well as the recently produced Black Girl Rock. Um, she also did the New Edition story. Uh, and of course, it's the number one cable award show, which is the BET Awards. She's been over that as well. She has been a leader in the network's largest expansion into original content in its history and earth ushering in BET into the documentary space with the BET True Series, which produced an award-winning pro project such as Katrina, 10 Years Later, and special coverage, social justice, in Ferguson, Missouri, and Baltimore. Prior to joining BET in 2007, Connie ran her own full-service production company, which collaborated with Jay-Z on the soundtrack for The Streets is Watching, and served as executive producer of Hype Williams' Big Dog Films. Uh, this New York native serves on the advisory board of Clark Atlanta University Television Department and runs uh, an endowment for black women interested in broadcast TV. Please welcome Connie Orlando. All right, next up, I would like to introduce Michelle Sneed. I've had the pleasure of visiting her place of work several times, and she's gonna tell you more about it. I think she works at one of the best places in Atlanta. Um, it absolutely is one of the largest campuses I've been to, but I can't wait for her to give you some more fantastic details. Michelle Sneed is a veteran television and telev film pr producer, executive with over 12 years of experience spanning the scripted and unscripted television arenas. As the president of production and development for Tyler Perry Studios, Sneed oversees all film, television, and digital media projects for the studio. Additionally, Additionally, she, is, she serves as the executive producer on the upcoming series, The Oval and Sisters, premiering on BET Networks this fall. Prior to her role as president of the studio, she served as the director of physical production for BET Networks from 2015 to 2018. She uh, now is at the new Tyler Perry Studios, uh, you know, and has been affiliated with Tyler for 10 years as a member of the studio's original production management team, which was originally at Greenbrier, a much smaller location, she produced over 400 episodes of television content. A graduate of Michigan State University, she now resides in Atlanta, Georgia. Please welcome Michelle Sneed. Sir, so again, now is this black women magic or what? <laughs> yeah. So I think one of the things that is so interesting uh, about each of your stories is that there's, you know, some humble beginnings. Now there's presidents and executive vice presidents and presidents of production, but it didn't just pop up that way. And I'd love for you, Vanessa, to really give us more background on how you got to that, especially that mark with animation. And I, I only have the notes of when you really came over the Fox. I know there's more to the history there. So I'd love for you to give us a little bit more background on just your story. Well, I'm from Northern California, but all my family <laughs> is from Arlington, Virginia, and Washington, DC. So I feel very much at home here. Um, I always loved film, and I went to film school at UCLA in Los Angeles. And I actually, I did dibble dabbled in different things right after, I went to Berkeley and then I went to film school at UCLA. After film school, I actually started working at Fox as an intern. Wow. So I was an intern. And I didn't know anything. I didn't know what time I was supposed to come. I didn't know how long I was supposed to stay. Um, but early on, I really gravitated towards development uh, and was lucky to have some great mentors. Um, I think that I've always gravitated towards family content in particular. Um, 
and I think part of my interest in family content was always the notion that I wanted to see people like myself as a kid mm -hmm. um, in kids programming and, and didn't see myself that often. Um, so I started off in the live action division of Fox and began, began doing movies that had CG elements to them. And through that, when Chris Miladonji, who now runs Illumination, when he left to start Illumination, they asked me if I wanted to head animation. Um, and I always, I said yes immediately, and I always kind of wonder why I said yes so quickly, having never worked in animation before, <laughs> because I had done CG, but I had never done animation. One was that I knew that I knew story, so I knew that even if I didn't know the particulars of everything, I knew story. Mm -hmm. I have always loved family content, so that was always in my wheelhouse. And then I was six months pregnant at the time, too. Wow. So my pregnancy brain <laughs> didn't overthink it, <laughs> which I always love to throw in there, too, because it was you know, an opportunity to do something I'd never done before, and have a family, and all these things kind of came together in, in that instance in an interesting way. And I really loved animation and loved that experience. Uh, and I ran uh, Fox Animation for 10 years. I began to kind of feel a calling again for wanting to do some live action. And so in this new job that I have, I can do some animation, but I can also do live action, which I'm excited about. Um, so that's really my story. That's fantastic. Now, we kind of glossed over these 10 years in animation because inside <laughs> of there is $3 billion worth of content and some titles that I remember like Rio, an ice age and these type of films really i think broke barriers my and for my children uh well my two girls my women now i should say really uh, they look at those films and they say that's what that's that's part of their history that's what they grew up on and one of the amazing things especially with ice age i remember when they, they asked me is that queen latifah mm -hmm. i said that is exactly <laughs> so talk to us about casting and just that process that window and some of the decisions you had to make from a diversity perspective that you felt were really critical and important for those franchises it's interesting because people always talk about, you know, diversity in casting and intentional intentionality in terms of making sure casts feel diverse. But the other thing that will happen naturally when diverse people are making content is that those things will just kind of come naturally to them. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, in many of the, the projects that I've uh, had the honor to be a part of, the notion of having a diverse cast has never been, it's always been intentional in the sense that it was put together intentionally, but it's such a part of the ethos of why I do what I do and why a lot of my colleagues do what they do until it, there was a natural and organic sense of the importance of making those casts diverse. The other movie that I always love to talk about was Rio because it really was birthed from uh, one of our Brazilian directors really feeling like he had never seen himself represented and that he had never seen Rio and Brazil and Latin America represented in a way that he felt ownership over. And so that was an example in terms of subject matter and specificity where you can have these big movies but you can look at it through a really specific eye. And in many ways, if you have kind of a genre and a story that's expansive and universal, that the particulars of it, the specificity of it, and the voice that comes through mm -hmm. should represent people in a specific way. Absolutely. So I think, um, you know, that's been really fundamental to my career. And as I now, Fox is a part of Disney, look to kind of the legacy of a Black Panther in, in, in animation, the legacy of Moana, which is one of my favorite movies, or Coco. Um, just the notion that now movies travel globally. 
this whole, we, they talked before about global representation and what that means, that you can have a movie that travels around the world and have it be diverse and have it have a specific voice and that, that can actually improve the global popularity of something. So it's, it's always wonderful. been fundamental to what I do and why I do it. But let me ask you this, um, as a mother, mm -hmm. do you think there's something keen that you, you look for or that it kind of crossed over into some of your thought processes in those areas? I know, you know, as a father, I think about what my daughters see. Mm -hmm. I, I pay attention to the content and the stories and because I want to know who they're going to model and who are they, who are they laying their eyes to and what that, you know, how that's going to see into their personalities and or their thought process. Do you think that being a mother gave you some perspective that you were able to bring to the table that probably maybe some other people around the table may not be able to I say? I think absolutely being a mother and having a 12, now 12 year old son who's out in the world as a young black boy, soon to be a young black man, makes you, I mean that's my reality and it's mm -hmm. who I love and who I want the best for. So in the same way, my mother would scour bookstores everywhere for images of little black girls for me. Um, it's just fundamental to my DNA that I'm going to have that perspective as the mother of a black boy to want to see things or to want him to see things and to want to create things that have his perspective in it along with other people's perspective in it. So, it's a part of who I am and definitely a part of what I do. Fantastic. You mentioned mentorship and Michelle, we were talking in the back about uh, kind of showing up to the office and who's going to get there first. And I could, had this vis visualization of you and Connie driving in, screeching, <laughs> trying to park. Like, I'm going to beat you, girl. I'm going to beat you. I'm going to go get in first. And, but getting to the office first and leaving it late. New York, it wasn't right. It was New York. Okay. <laughs> well, who's going to get on the train first? Uh, but talk about mentorship and what it means, knowing you two have a long-standing relationship and a mentorship kind of relationship as well, mentor-mentee relationship. For sure, for sure. In, in my career, from you know the very beginning, I can even think back to high school, uh, mentorship is everything. You know, mentorship, it's not even necessarily for me, in my experience, it's not necessarily the person that's doing exactly what I do. You know, it's not... Um, the person, you know, that I necessarily, you know, I, I want their job one day. It's that person where whether it's a, a woman thing, a black woman thing, um, a single thing, or whatever it is that's personal to me that I can relate to, I always try to identify those people. I just like the way they move, you know, and, and, and the way we, you know, we mesh. And especially if they're further along in their journey, in their professional journey, um, it, it gives me something to reference and even to talk to them about that they can relate to and share those similar experiences. And my relationship with Connie um, at BET for those three years, she definitely served as that for me. Um, you know, I reported to Connie in many ways and she always just, I just love the way she moved. You're just attracted to her, not just, you know, just looking at her, but just uh, the way she speaks to her staff, the way she leads. You know, by example, I know Connie started from the bottom, as we say. You know, so you respect somebody a little bit more, you know, when you know that they put in that work that you did and they, they assisted, you know, executives and, and, and humbled themselves and did all the jobs that other people don't want to do and climbed their way up and, you know, AP'd here and, you know, and then was able to produce and, and went through all of these levels. It, it was, it, we had a lot of similarities in that way. So I just, I just look up to Connie so much, and especially being you know, recently in the last year appointed to this role at Tyler Perry Studios as, as uh, you know, president of production and development, um, I thought about Connie, you know, the day that she was appointed in her position you know, a couple years ago, and I was there for that moment. And you know, what she did and how she reacted, um, I, that, I, that stuck with me, and I just kept playing that over and over. Um, in my head and how she, she took it and she commanded it. And, and I joked with uh, them in the back that, you know, I would see Connie, we'd come out of board meeting, you know, she'd hop on a conference call, put on an evening gown, come back in the office, change and go hop on a flight. 
you know, and it was just like, you know, that I needed that visual because I've never been that close to someone who who was doing boss things like that, you know, and I was right there to witness it and then to know them and to be able to relate to them and have similar interests in the type of content that we want to produce and who we want to produce for. That was everything to me, even at this point in my career now. So I thank you for that, Connie, on this stage. And as we've always talked about, and that, that, that just speaks to how important mentorship is. It makes it real. It makes it real for you. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. You know, Connie, many times in our industry, we talk about paying your dues and trusting the process. Uh, you don't start off as president. You start off as an intern or as a PA or in my office, someone is a coordinator. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you know, as time goes on and as people develop their skills and knowledge, uh, we find ways to navigate, or they find ways to navigate the system. But uh, I'd love you to tell folks kind of how that worked for you and what were some of the ups, some of the downs, maybe some of the lessons learned. First, I want to say thank you, and I am a fan of, of Michelle. She always beat me. Thank yeah, I never do that. <laughs> she got me again. No. But she's an incredible woman, and I'm just so proud of everything you're doing. Thank you. Um, so to answer your question, I started. So I was a finance major at Syracuse University, and when I uh, my first job, <laughs> when I I was a senior analyst at Chase for a year after school, and. Um, I, I'm great at numbers. I am a whiz. So, you know, my parents, I come from, I'm the first to go to college. And it was like, you're going to be an accountant, you're going to be a doctor, or you're going to be a lawyer. That was it. So I did the accountant finance route. Um, but on the weekends, I would, you know, I love music. And I would just PA with friends who wanted to be a, a music video director. Or <laughs> um, and it was just, it became a release from the, the week. Mm -hmm. And the industry at the time, it was the early 90s, and the industry was really growing. So I would PA every weekend, then go to the bank every, you know, during the week. And there was opportunities like, okay, why don't you, you know, can you PA during the week? So after about six months, I went to my parents and said, you know, I really want to explore this world. I'm a production assistant, and they had no idea what that meant. <laughs> <laughs> I'm making $40 a day, no benefits, and, but, I really, but I really love it. It was something that really spoke to my heart. Um, I like to create things. So they reluctantly, they said, OK, <laughs> try for a year, and then like, we'll, we'll revisit. Um, and they let, me, they let me explore this world. And for me, I was just curious. Like I'd be, I was a PA for a couple of years, but I, I was able to work with some of the most creative minds, mm -hmm. um, new directors, people that looked like us, creating content mm -hmm. uh, that was for us. And it was just a brand new world. And because it was an industry that was growing, then you needed more production managers and more producers because there were more directors and music videos were really becoming a strong marketing tool uh, for the, the music industry. So I was able to kind of capitalize on the rise to that. And then in that, you know, I started my own uh, production company because I was management at SU. And I was like, okay, so if you, if you have your own company, the economics are different. Okay. So I did that and, you know, a friend of mine was at a label. He gave me like six videos that were like, you know, between $10,000 and $12,000. And we knocked them out the park. And then people started hiring my company. And I would just take directives. Somebody wanted to direct. I was like, yeah, just run it through my company. And we all kind of grew on the ride together, and that kind of ended with um, Hype Williams. Yes. Um, somebody's like, you need to meet uh, Harold Williams. And he was from Queens. I'm from Queens. Harold? Yeah, it's yeah. Harold. It's, it's Harold Williams. Harold. And we met, and I remember it was the first day I was moving to Manhattan. I was big time. I was going to move to Manhattan. And he called me. And we had tried to c catch up before that, but our schedule just never meshed. And he was like, you know what? I have a video coming up. It was like a Tuesday. He's like, it's on Saturday. Um, and it's Jay-Z's Can't Knock the Hustle. And I was like, you know, I really want to work with this dude. Let me put off the move. And then we just went into production. And literally, and that was before Jay-Z was Jay-Z and everybody was everybody. But that one, that one risk I took, mm -hmm. like, just opened a totally new world. And I think it's so important, like, you talk about mentorship and people that are ahead of the journey, but a lot of the people that I came up with it's also about those who are next to you. Mm -hmm. um, I can make a lot of phone calls today because there was a PA named Jack Benson 
that was next to me, and now he's at certain places. So it's so important to also, like I get um, wanting to mentor up, but you have so many people that are right next to you that are so important and, and smart and like form collectives, form groups, like you're stronger together, like it's, it's so important, especially today with all the opportunities that you know we didn't have where you can make a phone a film on your phone and put it up on YouTube like right. get see who's right next to you often mm -hmm. those folks can actually uplift you more than uh, the folks that are have already done it because every journey is different well you know relationships matter and especially in this industry and I remember there was a young lady uh, I was at the time working with Will Packer and Rob Hardy and we were doing they were doing small films independent films and a young lady named Diane Ashford yeah. quit her job. I think she was in Cincinnati or somewhere. Mm -hmm. And she came down to Atlanta and said, I just want to intern in PA. And she saved up a little money and uh, worked hard. I mean, we worked her hard. I feel bad. He still works her hard <laughs> to this day. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember watching Diane be as diligent as possible. And she told her mother, you know, I, I, she wanted a year, and she, she said, I want to pursue this passion. And, but she also saved her money and did the right things and uh, stayed the course, and now she is the producer. And I see her all the time, uh, and I see her name all the time on Ambitions right now. Mm -hmm. Every time Ambitions pops up, it says, produced by Diane Ashford. And uh, she says how proud it is for that moment, just, to, just when it comes across the screen. And she's also producing at Tyler Perry Studios. Mm -hmm. uh, so pursuing those dreams and taking those risks and challenges, sometimes, especially in our, our households, African-American or minority households, sometimes that hasn't always been the cornerstone of parental conversation. My parents said, hey, go to school, get a good job, get a pension, save some money, retire, live well. Right? It never was in the cars to take a lot of risk. And, you know, and, and, and also, there wasn't a lot of conversation about how much I leave for not my children, but my children's children. That's a new conversation. One person that did talk to me about leaving something for his children's children was Mr. Tyler Perry. And now, 330 acres later, <laughs> I think he has a lot to leave. Yeah. Uh, but, but Michelle, tell us what is that? What really is Tyler Perry Studios? And, wow. and give us a little peek. I know the grand opening is coming up in October, and yeah. October is a big month for you guys. You have two yeah. new shows, yeah. uh, Sisters, I believe, which launches on October, October 9th. 9th. And along with Oval, same night, so a double premiere. And I Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Indeed. But tell us a little bit about Tyler Perry Studios. Wow. Well, Tyler Perry Studios, for me, you know, we I go back with Tyler Perry Studios to 2009. I was there for six years before going to BET for a couple of years and coming back now in this position. Um, Tyler Perry Studios is, in fact, Tyler Perry. Uh, Tyler Perry uh, is a person who is a visionary, he's a person who is a provider, um, and he is a person who is all about um, opportunity. And that's what he's built there. So we've built a whole lot of opportunity on these 330 acres, you know, 40 historic buildings, on the, 40 buildings are on the, historic, the National Historic Register, um, a couple lakes, a golf course, you know, and, and all of this, 12 sound stages, um, all of this that, you know, it's not just, it's, it's not boasting to say that. It is that this black man has acquired this land that was once a Confederate Army base, and he owns it. And he sacrificed by sleeping in his car and by uh, doing all of the work that we talked about that nobody else wants to do. When he used to make film, do his plays back in the day, he carried the equipment and he set up the stages and he did the wardrobe and uh, he put on his own, you know, put on the makeup and he did all of that. And that's what Tyler Perry Studios is. It's, it's sacrifice and it's a commit, it's being committed to whatever your commitments are. So, and, and it's, it's about providing opportunity, it's about ownership. And, um, and, I, and I believe that's what we're building there, and that's what, that's what we hope to spread. Yeah, and it has to be a great feeling to get off 
you, to, uh, your studio <laughs> off your exit yes, off the yes, freeway. Yes. That's got to be a great thing. Absolutely. Color. You know, shout out to the city of Atlanta and East Point for making that happen and for seeing what we see in Tyler and the vision and the future and, you know, his 20 year commitment to, 25 year commitment to Atlanta so far. Um, and that, that was just everything. You know, uh, we give so much to the city, the city gives so much to us. And just to see where Atlanta was before the Georgia Film Tax Credit, Tyler was there. And we'll, you know, we'll be there whatever, whatever changes. And, um, and that is what, you know, when we, when we get something like our own exit, um, not just off Langford Parkway, but off 85, yeah. you know, when, we, when we're able to, to see that, you know, the day that it went up, uh, we were actually shooting and a few of us, you know, actually went out to watch the install and we were able to document it. And we showed Tyler the video while, by the way, he's working 14 hours on the stage. You know, he's literally writing and he's literally directing. And we showed him this video. And the first thing that came to his mind was when he used to sleep in a motel, pay night by night on Buford <coughs> Highway and ride down that exit and see the Fort McPherson accident and all of that. So it was just this kind of full circle moment for him. And he has those often. And to, to witness that, that just goes back into what, what Tyler Perry Studios is. And I truly believe, not to sound cliche, anything is possible. And Tyler believes that it all starts with dreams. The dream, dreaming is planning. And that is why everything we do, even with our grand opening, you'll see the name of our headquarters is the Dream Building. Um, it, it, all, it all starts there because he believes that dreaming is planning. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I want you to get your questions ready. We do have a mic here. Uh, I'm going to come to a Q&A here in just one second, so we'd love for you to line up at the mic uh, to prepare your question. And let, me be, let me ask you, be mindful that I, I really want questions. Uh, you know, keep your commentary pretty tight, but let's get to the question so we can accommodate our guests. There was a young lady, and raise your hand again, baby, that, that said she wants to be an animator. Uh, an animation. Awesome. Yes. I, uh, I would like to ask you, Vanessa, I mean, when you see that, and, and I told her, I said, she, you need to know Vanessa. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, Come on, you better get up to that mic. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. Get to the mic first. I, I want to ask Vanessa, what, what does it do for your spirit and your soul? And what is it that you think really inspires? And because you, you are a huge inspiration. I think all of you are. And sometimes we just move through the world and we do what we do. But when something like that comes up, what does that mean to you? It means everything. I mean, we need so many of us in in all fields, but especially in animation. And I think of animation as being this unique kind of combination between storytelling and technology and, you know, creativity. And so, you know, I think I really appreciate the fact that people took a chance on me and, and that somebody will take a chance on you. And um, because it's not, a, it's not always a clear path there you know it, it's it's something that um, we need more of us in animation so bravo to you and go ahead ask your question and we love to have right, so hi my name is Angel Rich I'm named the next Steve Jobs by Forbes magazine I was trying to notice now I'm named the next Steve Jobs by Forbes magazine I'm the only um, company in the in the world recognized by the Entertainment Software Association as an actual industry company in gaming. Um, we create financial literacy games. But in addition to that, I have a film production company for animations. And I've been trying to uh, leverage my gamers and animators to be able to create these animations. And we're trying to produce a cartoon called uh, Professor Rich. It's about an eight-year-old um, girl that's also a professor of a bank. And she has these super bank friends. And she solves social <laughs> justice it. issues through tech. And it has been really hard to try to um, work with a studio or, uh, or to, to pretty much try to get this picked up or either find other black animators that are able to produce the story, in, like you said, in sort of the, the natural way that it needs to be. So I, I have a ton of questions and I'm gonna, I will hopefully would like to talk to you offline. But at a baseline, how do you find these black animators to be able to work on your projects? And then secondly, 
like you said, is not an easy path to navigate. So how do you find these studios that are looking for uh, black cartoons? The owner of the Jellies once said that there's less than five of them in the world right now. And so wow. it's, it's very difficult to get these black cartoons out. Just any advice that you have on that, because I have really been trying. <laughs> Wait, I, can I just interrupt? We're going to go to the back. I'm going to put you on the phone. Okay. Okay. prisoner of hope in pilot format. And, and my question is, everybody wants ratchet crime programming, but nobody wants to look at the type of programming that I just produced, that I can see yet. Um, this programming is designed to rebuild the family unit for those who have had incarceration in their family and to restore empathy in America. I went to jail undercover for 60 days, and my question to you guys is, how do we get the networks to get interested in something called crime-adjacent programming? Mm -hmm. We're interested. <laughs> no, we're absolutely, and I think when you, like you said, the, the rapid programming versus other programming, like we're always interested in something that's next and different. Um, at BET, we try not to go down certain paths, but we're absolutely interested in just taking back narratives, and it sounds like just on the short, short pitch, that it's about a story. Like We want to tell stories that relate to our communities, that people see it and they, they have some attachment to. So for BET, it's, 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 it's an easy ask. And you said you had a pilot. Yes. I'll exchange numbers with you, and I'll connect you, and let us see your pilot. That sounds good. There. Thank you. I'm glad I got up. Thank you. Listen, so I don't know about you, but if you're interested, you might want to get this mic quick. <laughs> Going down. Right. <laughs> so, your question. Hello, everyone. My name is Shanetta Spriggs, and I am with Main Course Encouragement Media with my wonderful husband. Wave your hand. Thank you. And we are a young black couple working together, and um, working in media and oh, sorry, working in media and procurement. With Main Course Encouragement Media, my most recent project was with eSports, and we presented an infomercial, I'm sure. <laughs> we presented an infomercial in front of the HBCU presidents this week and also in front of Riot Games. They are looking for a way, and they are over League of Legends, which is a very massive game that is in eSports. And eSports industry, like was said earlier, that gaming is over a $30 billion industry. At the end of this year, will be 138 billion because of esports as well. Do you see um, an interest with black people, with them being able to, excuse me, with them being able to have content that will be in the media that will show interest of those wanting to partner with that? Wow. I say absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that. Uh, the research also shows that African Americans are the number one consumers in, in most media. 
you know, as far and relevant to whatever specific age demographic you're looking at. So I think that, you know, that's the way we're going. You know, in Atlanta, the tech industry is booming. It's number one, I believe, even at this, at this point, as far as new technology and incubators and all of that kind of stuff, and definitely in regards to gaming specifically. Um, so I think you're right on course, and you're right where the industry is going. I mean, we all know in this room, and, and that's Connie and our job, and Vanessa, uh, to, you know, TV is not what it once was. And you know, there's other routes to, to all, everything, and that includes media and gaming. So I think that you're definitely you know, on, the, on the right path, for sure. Okay, okay. and let I want to mention, oh. Sorry. Let, let me add, uh, the gaming, specifically eSports, is about to explode. Mm -hmm. Now, you, the two of you being on the forefront is critical. Um, I think one of the things you should consider is how well uh, and how often you're out educating people that can be advocates for you mm -hmm. in certain rooms or certain spaces and places where you may not either have access to or you just may not be. So, I mean, for us, you know, we would work with Representative Val Demings and uh, our Congress, or your local Congress person uh, to say, okay, here's what I'm doing and here's why it's so important. Because if there's an economic impact around jobs, if you're talking about an industry that uh, there may be low awareness of, but it can create you know, tremendous opportunities for, for those around you, I think that's a conversation that anyone would really want to have. So key is education. I, I can tell you now, even though I said eSports, I would say maybe 50% of this room, maybe even more, probably really doesn't know what that means. Right. Or they have never been exposed to it directly. I've been exposed to it. I've been in championships and in rooms. And there is so much energy, so much money, and so much activity. But we're not there. The only place we are is we're at the console, right? And I have young nephews that will sit in front of the console, and they will play until their fingers are cramped. But they're not participating in the product. And I think that's where there's a great, great opportunity. And if now, if you're also dealing with the HBCUs, you have to educate HBCU president. I sit on the board of Florida A&M University, the greatest HBCU on the planet. <laughs> um, and <laughs> just so you know, and there's advocates like myself that would love to work with you all to go in and talk to the HBCU presidents around how important it is for, for those students at those campuses to get involved with esports now. And let's not wait till we're, we're, we're pulling up the train you know, the caboose, we should be on the forefront. Yes, thank you. And the infomercial that we have, it actually talks about all of that.